off. So uh, this is the third of the Frankie lectures this year, uh, which I held in conjunction with the Frankie seminar, that which this semester is on Heidegger's being in time. And I am absolutely delighted to uh, welcome Robert Brandom to us here at Yale. Uh, Brandom, as I'm sure many of you know, is arguably one of the leading philosophers in the world, and he has been selected to present, um, to give many of the most prestigious international lecture series, including the John Locke lectures in 2006. He's currently a professor of philosophy at the University of Pittsburgh, and he works across a wide range of fields in philosophy, uh, ranging from philosophy of language, philosophy of mind, philosophy of logic, uh, to German idealism and neo-pragmatism. So among his uh, many books, uh, the monumental Making It Explicit from 1994 is usually considered to be his most important work, uh, along with Between Saying and Doing Towards an Analytic Pragmatism. Uh, I also want to make a case though for Tales of the Mighty Dead, not just because it's a great, great title, but because it's a great example of uh, Brandom's unique ability to combine doing systematic philosophy in his own right with uh, really contributing to understanding of the history of philosophy. So in uh, Tales of the Mighty Dead, uh, the Mighty Dead include uh, Descartes, Spinoza, Leibniz, Kant, Hegel, Frege, Heidegger and Sellers, uh, who are all given great treatment in their own right, but also contribute to further Brandom's own thought. Uh, as just a little sample of his thought, I want to quote one thing that I always quote to my students, and I think Brandom has given the best <coughs> definition of the di difference between dualistic and dialectical thinking. So Brandom says that like a distinction becomes a dualism when you can no longer explain the relation between the terms distinguished. You know? uh, then you've gotten stuck in dualism, whereas if you're doing dialectics, you'll be able to distinguish the terms while still accounting for their relation and accounting for their inseparability. And uh, Brandom is really a master at doing that in his work. Uh, since uh, I'm sure his work can seem daunting to a lot of people, in, not in professional philosophy, I also want to just end with two recommendations of where to begin. The first is to read the first chapter of Making It Explicit, uh, which is just extraordinarily lucid. Uh, and also, like, when I read that the first time, I realized like, all of these discussions of normativity in the last couple of decades, I realized, like, oh, this is the crystalline source of all of these discussions and like going there will like you will be able to orient yourself in, in, in that contemporary debate much much better and the second tips I want to give is the great book on Hegel's phenomenology that's coming out in May, A Spirit of Trust like many others uh, I've been reading versions of that online for many years but finally we're gonna get a bound copy that clocks in at a modest 800 pages uh, and it's a preview from that book that we'll have the pleasure of hearing tonight. So please join me in welcoming Robert Fandom to Yale. Thank you. But he should really say welcoming me back to Yale. I was an undergraduate here, and that's a very special place to me. Hegel thinks that the most important event in human history, simply the single biggest thing that ever happened to us, is the extended transition from long-standing traditional forms of life to distinctively modern ones. And he introduces and develops an original conception of the subject of this great sea change, what he calls Geist, spirit. Geist is us as discursive beings, knowers and doers, and it includes all our norm-governed doings, thinkings, sayings, practices, and institutions, and all of their products. Prelapsarian traditional understanding took normative statuses to be features of the objective world. How it's proper to behave, how things ought to be done, what things are fitting, proper relations of subordination and superiority are all thought of as central features of how things anyway are, like the weight of stones, or the color of the sky. People's stations and their corresponding duties are construed as being what they are antecedently to and independently of the practical attitudes of those whose stations and duties they are. It's the job of individual subjects to reflect those self-standing normative statuses in their attitudes, to shape their acknowledgments and attributions of authority and responsibility 
so that they fit the pre-existing normative facts. The principle defining traditional, what Hegel calls zittlich, forms of Geist is commitment to the norm governedness or status dependence of normative attitudes. The contrasting core modern idea, articulated and developed to begin with by Enlightenment thinkers, is that there were no normative statuses, for instance, of subordination and superiority, no authority and responsibility, until people started practically taking or treating each other as subordinates and superiors, authoritative and responsible. That modern idea is the idea of the attitude dependence of normative statuses. This idea takes a particularly clear and explicit form in social contract theories of political obligation. For there, attitudes of consent by the governed are treated as essential to the legitimate authority of those who govern, epitomized in the model of instituting normative statuses of reciprocal obligation by attitudes of intending to be bound, manifested practically by entering into an explicit contract or compact. On this model, norms are not found but made. Normative statuses are instituted by social normative practical attitudes, such as promising, agreeing, or contracting. Hegel both sees the replacement of traditional thought institutions and selves by modern ones as a decisive irrevocable advance, and also diagnoses it as a disruption that inevitably incurs substantial costs. The cover term he coins to characterize that unavoidable loss is alienation, and fremdung. Although it has psychological consequences, alienation is not, at base, a psychological phenomenon. It's a distinctively metaphysical structure of normativity itself. It's a structure characterized by the absence of the bindingness of norms, a structure in which attitudes are no longer answerable to or responsible to norms. The largest philosophical lesson Hegel thinks we can learn from thinking about the great structural shift of Geist from its pre-modern to its modern form is the result of the detailed interplay of gain and loss, advance and retreat that characterize that transition. The right understanding of how those interwoven strands are related points the way he thinks toward the third stage in the development of Geist. Such a third structure of Geist must retain the irreversible progress in self-consciousness of ourselves as free that consists in realizing the attitude dependence of normative statuses, while reachieving practical zittlich appreciation of the status dependence of normative attitudes, the way in which normative attitudes are obliged to respect and reflect norms that serve as standards of assessment for the correctness of those attitudes. Zittlichkeit is practically appreciating and responding to the obligation to conform our attitudes to the actual normative statuses those attitudes acknowledge and attribute. This is to aim at acknowledging and attributing what we and others are really committed to, our actual responsibilities. And it's the loss of this zittlich practical appreciation of the status dependence of normative attitudes that Hegel denominates the alienation that he takes to be a hallmark of modernity. What we're alienated from is the norms that we have made and that make us what we are. So there's a tension between the claim central to modernity that normative statuses are instituted by normative attitudes, and the claim central to traditional understanding that normative statuses provide the standards for assessment of the correctness of attitudes. How can we both make the norms and be genuinely governed by them? Here one might think of Wittgenstein's observation that if whatever is going to seem right to me is right, that only means that here we can't talk about right. The third postmodern stage of Geist is defined by its reconciliation of those opposed insights. How does Hegel propose that these two criteria of adequacy on an account of the relations between normative attitudes and normative statuses can be satisfied? The shortest answer, I think, is that our past attitudes institute norms that provide the normative standards of assessment for our current attitudes. But such a slogan conceals the rich, fine structure of his account. He thinks that we institute norms that govern our attitudes by engaging in a special kind of process, recollection. His word is erinnerung. Recollection retrospectively rationally reconstructs the prior applications of a concept, picking out an expressively progressive trajectory through them. 
To say that the rationally reconstructed tradition is expressively progressive is to say that it takes the form of the gradual emergence into explicitness of a determinate conceptual content, which provides a norm governing applications of that concept. And that content is exhibited as having been implicit all along. Each application reveals some contour of the concept. This process of recollection adopts an essentially retrospective perspective. The owl of Minerva flies only at dusk. It's this process that turns a mere past into a history, something with the edifying narrative structure of a tradition, a past comprehended, he says. Its reasons march through history. This idea of recollective rationality is one of Hegel's big ideas. In the rest of the talk, I want to drill down by looking at a special case of that recollective reconciliation of traditional and modern structures of norm-governed and norm-instituting practices and the sort of understanding of them that's enabled by the meta-concepts of Hegelian Vernunft. The particular dimension of our geistic activities that I'll address is intentional agency and the self-conscious understanding of it, both theoretical and practical, that is an essential aspect of it. Hegel calls the traditional Zitlich practical understanding of intentional agency heroic. By this he means that agents take responsibility for their doings under all the descriptions that are true of those doings. No normative distinction is made between what was done intentionally or what the agent knew he was doing on the one hand and what he did unintentionally and without realizing that that was what he was doing on the other. So Oedipus is held responsible for killing his father and marrying his mother, even though he didn't intend to do those things and was not aware that that's what he's doing. For those are still things that he did, not things that just happened. Here we might think of Anscombe's slogan, I do what happens. Oedipus did intend to kill that man and marry that woman. On the traditional heroic conception, it's the normative statuses that matter, not the agent's attitudes. Parasite and incest ought not to be. One should not act so as to incur the normative status of father killer or motherfucker. The ought to do's governing attitudes are just to be read off of the ought to be's that articulate statuses. Attitudes of knowing and intending matter only in determining that one is responsible for a deed, not for determining what one did thereby. The status one acquires by doing something is not itself construed as mitigated by or otherwise relativized in any way to the attitudes of intending and knowing in virtue of which it counts as one's doing in the first place. That one did not mean to do what one did can engender sympathy, but it does not in any way diminish responsibility. It's for this reason, Hegel thinks, that the traditional heroic practical conception of agency is inevitably always also a tragic conception. The tragedy doesn't consist in the transcendent awfulness of the outcome, which is pretty much what current usage has whittled the concept of tragedy down to. It consists rather in the fact that in acting at all, one puts oneself at the mercy of forces outside of one's knowledge and control. Those alien forces determine the content of one's actual deed, what one turns out to have done, and equivalently to be responsible for having done. Hegel quotes in this connection a medieval European proverb that says, when a flung stone leaves the hand, it belongs to the devil. Tragedy is the submission of the heroic agent to fate. And the idea of fate here invokes not some sort of determinism or antecedent necessitation of outcome, but just the presence of those dark because unknowable and uncontrollable forces that en engulf and overwhelm what is launched by one's limited knowledge and intention, transforming it into deeds that inevitably reach far beyond those attitudes into an unforeseeable status of culpability. Shouldering the responsibility that fate in this sense brings down upon one who acts is tragic heroism. This is the intimate, mutually presupposing relation between tragedy, fate, and heroism that Hegel sees structuring ancient Greek normativity. By contrast to this tragic practical conception of agency in terms of heroic identification with and submission to one's fate, the modern conception of agency is distinguished precisely by the idea 
that agents are genuinely responsible for, and so should be held responsible for, only what they intended to do and knew they were doing. Donald Davidson well articulates the distinction at the core of the modern conception when he distinguishes among the specifications of things one has genuinely done between descriptions under which one, what one did is intentional, say, turning on the light, and descriptions of what one did that are merely consequential, alerting the burglar of whom one was unaware. What makes an event a doing at all, something that's imputable to an agent, is that it's intentional under some description. But that event then counts as a doing under all its specifications, including those that pick it out by consequences that were not intended or foreseen by the agent. It's of the essence of the modern idea of practical responsibility that acknowledgments and attributions of the normative status of responsibility are conditioned by and proportional to the agent's attitudes of intending and believing. It's now seen to be unjust to condemn or blame someone for what they did because it satisfies consequential descriptions under which the agent did not intend it and could not foresee it. Those attitudes of agents, what they intend and believe, are taken to play constitutive roles in determining their normative status as culpable or admirable. This conception of responsibility as proportion to intention and knowledge is the application to the practical understanding of intentional agency of the distinctively modern appreciation of the attitude dependence of normative statuses. The core of distinctively modern practical self-consciousness is for Hegel a special way of understanding what he calls the distinction that action implies between what is purposed and what is accomplished in the realm of existence. It's to distinguish two senses in which agents do things, a narrower and a wider one, and to restrict responsibility to what's done in the narrower sense. Here's a long quote that's on your handout. It's the right of the will to recognize as its action and to accept responsibility only those aspects of the deed which it knew to be presupposed within its end and which were present in its purpose. I can be made accountable for a deed only if my will was responsible for it. That's the right of knowledge. He explicitly appeals to this distinction as marking the decisive difference from traditional practical conceptions of agency. Another quote, the heroic self-consciousness, as in ancient tragedies like that of Oedipus, has not yet progressed from its unalloyed simplicity to reflect on the distinction between deed and action, between the external event and the purpose and knowledge of the circumstances, or to analyze the consequences minutely, but accepts responsibility for the deed in its entirety. Hegel takes it that making this distinction between Tat and Handlung, the deed and the action, is a decisive advance in our understanding of ourselves as agents. But this new level of practical self-consciousness courts the danger of a distinctive kind of alienation from its deeds. He says, consciousness, therefore, through its experience, in which it should have found its truth, has really become a riddle to itself. The consequences of its deeds are not for it the deeds themselves. What befalls it is for it not the experience of what it is in itself. The transition is not a mere alteration of the form of the same content and essence, now presented as the content and again as the object or outwardly beheld essence of itself. I've been using a particular regimented normative metavocabulary to render the terms that Hegel uses to set out the contrast, his contrast, between categories of Verstand, or understanding, and those of Vernunft, or reason. It translates Hegel's talk of what subjects are in themselves and what they are for themselves and for others into talk of normative statuses and normative attitudes. Under the heading of normative statuses, Hegel's talk of independence and dependence is translated into talk about authority and responsibility. And under the heading of normative attitudes, his talk about what subjects are for themselves and for others is translated into talk about acknowledging responsibility or claiming authority for oneself and attributing those statuses to others. In these <coughs> terms, the meta-conception of Vernunft he recommends and develops is what explains the reciprocity of the normative statuses of authority and responsibility, the sense in which they're always, for him, two sides of one coin. It explains the reciprocity of normative recognitive attitudes, 
of acknowledging and attributing authority and responsibility. And it explains the reciprocal dependence between those reciprocal relations among statuses and among attitudes. In doing so, it reconciles the distinctively modern insight into the attitude dependence of normative statuses, the sense in which statuses of authority and responsibility are instituted by reciprocal recognitive attitudes, with the traditional appreciation of the status dependence of normative attitudes, the dimension along which attributions and acknowledgments of commitments, responsibilities undertaken by exercising one's authority to do so, answer for their correctness to what agents are really committed to. The alienation that is the worm and the shiny apple of modernity is the practical incapacity to see how normative statuses can both be instituted by normative attitudes and transcend those attitudes so as genuinely to govern and constrain them. Kant's autonomy version of the Enlightenment idea that normative statuses are instituted by normative attitudes takes it that knowing and acting subjects are distinguished from merely natural creatures by a distinctive sort of authority they have. That's the authority to commit themselves, the normative capacity of making themselves responsible by taking themselves to be responsible. Hegel applauds both the idea that the basic normative status is the authority to adopt normative attitudes, for Kant to acknowledge commitments, and the idea that normative statuses, commitments, that is responsibilities, are instituted by normative attitudes. Hegel objects, though, to the idea that any individual's attitudes can immediately constitute normative statuses. That sort of authority he sees as an instance of the practical conception of normativity in terms of what he calls pure independence, authority without commensurate responsibility, that's characteristic of the master whose commands unilaterally institute obligations or responsibilities for the slave in his master-slave allegory of traditional normative structure of obedience and uh, subordination. As such, right, as such, it's an instance of that traditional practical subordination, obedience, structural understanding of normativity. And from Hegel's point of view, it's a flaw in the Kantian autonomy account that this foundational normative status, the distinctive kind of authority to commit oneself, in virtue of which one is a discursive subject of cognitive commitments as to how things are and practical commitments as to how things shall be, is not construed by Kant as itself instituted by normative attitudes. It's just treated as a metaphysical fact. We have the authority to commit ourselves. Hegel's idea is that we should understand the commitments of normative subjects as instituted not by their own attitudes of acknowledgement alone, as Kant's autonomy model has it, but only by those attitudes when suitably complemented by attributions of those commitments to them by others who attribute to them the authority so to commit themselves and hold them responsible. That is, the authority to commit oneself is itself instituted in part by the attitudes of others who attribute it. Kant's being responsible for respecting the dignity of others is being responsible for attributing autonomy to them, but he didn't take that to be constitutive of autonomy. Hegel's term for the attitude of attributing the basic Kantian normative status, that is the authority to adopt a status by adopting an attitude, making oneself responsible by taking oneself to be responsible, is recognition, anarchenum. In place of Kant's individualistic autonomy model of the institution of normative statuses by normative attitudes, he proposes a social recognition model. According to that model, normative statuses are instituted by reciprocal recognition. To be responsible, one must, as Kant had already insisted, in the first instance acknowledge that responsibility, at least implicitly. But one must also be held responsible by others, to whom one attributes the authority to adopt such authoritative attitudes. To attribute to someone the authority to hold one responsible, that is, to attribute commitments in a partly constitutive way, is to recognize that other subject. Hegelian recognitive attitudes, like Kantian autonomous attitudes, institute normative statuses. But they do so only when suitably socially complemented. The recognitive authority of individual normative subjects and of their recognitive communities are complementary and reciprocally dependent 
that is responsible to each other as well as authoritative over each other. On the recognitive picture, normative statuses are all instituted by normative attitudes, but only when those attitudes exhibit a particular social structure, the stru structure of mutual or reciprocal recognition. Normative attitudes of acknowledging oneself and attributing responsibilities to others, and of claiming or exercising authority for oneself and acknowledging the authority of or attributing authority to others must be complementary to be efficacious. And in such a structure, the normative statuses of authority and responsibility those recognitive attitudes institute are also always reciprocal and coordinate. One might think, I think one clearly ought to, ought to think, uh, that there is a sense of normative status, paradigmatically of responsibility and authority, that's sensibly construed as socially instituted by reciprocal recognitive attitudes in the way required for what I've called the basic Hegelian normative statuses. Even so, one might, might want to object that they're normative statuses that are more objective than, than these intersubjectively constituted ones. What's left out of the picture of normative statuses as instituted by reciprocal recognitive attitudes, one wants to say, is the fact that some normative statuses are objective in a sense that lets them serve as normative standards for assessment of the correctness of attitudes of attributing or claiming them. Just so. The attitude dependence of normative statuses, which motivates the models both of the basic Kantian normative metastatus of autonomy and of the basic Hegelian normative metastatus of reciprocal recognition, must somehow be balanced by acknowledgement of the status dependence of normative attitudes. The sense in which the attitudes of acknowledging and attributing normative statuses are responsible to the statuses that subjects actually have, the sense in which those attitudes are themselves norm-governed. Understanding that aspect of the relations between normative attitudes and normative statuses, and incorporating that understanding in our practices and institutions, is what's required to move Geist from its modern to its postmodern phase. We're to do that by moving from pra practically construing ourselves and our discursive activities according to meta-concepts exhibiting the structure of Verstand, to construing ourselves and our discursive activities according to meta-concepts exhibiting the structure of Vernunft. The key, to the, way, the key to understanding the way Hegel moves beyond the basic Hegelian normative statuses, socially instituted by synchronic reciprocal relations of recognitive attitudes, consists in appreciating the orthogonal diachronic historical dimension of recognitive processes. His social story has to be complemented by his historical story. It is in particular the recollective phase of diachronic recognitive processes that explains the attitude transcendence of normative statuses. That includes the special cognitive representational norms according to which representing attitudes are responsible for their correctness to standards set by what counts as represented by those representings just in virtue of exercising that distinctive kind of authority over them. Discursive norms, both practical and cognitive, are understood according to the categories of Vernunft as features of essentially social and historical recognitive processes, developing in tandem with attitudes that articulate them. Understanding operating according to the categories of Verstand is blind to both the social and the historical dimensions of conceptual norms. So I want now to look more closely at how Hegel describes and motivates the transition to the third age of Geist, which still lies ahead of us. The spirit chapter of the phenomenology rehearses the progressive development from the traditional to the modern structure of Geist, so as to pre prepare us readers for the epiphany in which that development can culminates, the envisaged transition to the third postmodern stage, the age of trust. Hegel introduces this newly self-conscious form of normativity, and hence subjectivity, in the rhetorical form of a pair of allegories, the allegory of the hero and his valet, and the allegory of the penitent confessing his transgression to the hard-hearted, unforgiving judge. Hegel introduces the first with a well-known slogan of his day, 
No man is a hero to his valet, followed by his own twist on it. Not, however, because the man is not a hero, but because the valet is a valet. The hero is allegorical for one who acts out of appreciation of his duty, one who fulfills his responsibilities, one who acts as he ought, as he's committed to act, one who in his practical attitudes and actions acknowledges the bindingness or authority of norms. Valet is the English translation of the German Kammerdiener, literally room servant. The valet in the allegory sees the attitudes of the hero not as governed by and expressions of the acknowledgments of norms, but as the product of immediate sensuous desires and contingent particular inclinations. The valet views what the hero does genealogically in resolutely naturalistic, non-normative, reductive terms. And so, as the quote on your handout continues, explains the action as resulting from selfish motives. Just as every action is capable of being looked at from the point of view of conformity to duty, so too it can be consider considered from the point of view of the particularity of the doer. If the action is accompanied by fame, then it knows this inner aspect to be a desire for fame. The inner aspect is judged to be an urge to secure his own happiness, even though this were to consist merely in an inner moral conceit, in the enjoyment of being conscious of his own superiority, and in the foretaste of a hope of future happiness. No action can escape such judgment. For duty for duty's sake, this pure purpose is an unreality. It becomes a reality in the deed of an individuality, and the action is thereby charged with the aspect of particularity." End of the quote. The Kammerdiener stands for a view that explains all attitudes in terms of other attitudes, without needing to appeal to the governing norms or statuses that their attitudes towards and acknowledgments of. Hegel doesn't deny that this sort of explanation in terms of attitudes alone can be done. The norm-blind, reductive naturalist perspective is an available, though one-sided, perspective. But we can ask, what sort of disagreement is it that divides the Kammerdiener and the friend of the norms, for whom some heroes really are heroes? Is it a cognitive, matter-of-factual disagreement about what there is in the objective world? After all, for Hegel, Modernity was just right that normative statuses are attitude dependent. But Hegel diagnoses the issue rather as a difference in meta-attitude. He denominates the norm-blind reductive naturalism of attitudes, for which the Kammerdiener stands, as niederträchtig. The contrasting norm-sensitive status-aware hero-acknowledging meta-attitude that takes some attitudes to be themselves genuinely norm-sensitive and norm-acknowledging he calls Edelmütig. So Niederträchtig is something like literally pulling down and Edelmütig is magnanimous. So perhaps there's just a subjective practical choice to be made, depending on one's preference for tough-minded, skeptical Niederträchtigkeit or tender-minded, generous Edelmütigkeit. But that isn't Hegel's view either. Those two possibilities, matter of objective fact, or subjective preference, exhaust the possibilities that modern Verstand admits. But he thinks rather that in being discursive beings at all, in believing and acting, we've already implicitly committed ourselves to an Edelmutig meta-attitude. This is a possibility afforded by Vernunft, which when it comes to explicit self-consciousness, ushers in the postmodern structure of Geist. The issue addressed by the allegory of the Kammerdiener concerns the intelligibility of the traditional idea of the status dependence of normative attitudes in the face of the modern insight into the attitude dependence of normative statuses. The Kammerdiener stands for the self-sufficiency, the explanatory sovereignty of attitudes. But then what room is there for the authority and efficacy of norms, for the idea that normative statuses of authority and responsibility, what one is really entitled or committed to, make a real difference to attitudes that accordingly deserve to be thought of as acknowledgments of those norms. Normative governance of attitudes by norms or statuses has two dimensions, deontic and alethic. First, the norms, the normative statuses, serve as standards for assessment of the correctness of attitudes. My attitudes of acknowledging a commitment myself or attributing a commitment to others 
are correct, just in case we really are committed, in case those attitudes properly reflect the statuses those attitudes are attitudes towards. This is what it is for the attitudes in question to be normative attitudes, attitudes towards norms, attitudes of acknowledging or attributing normative statuses. But second, the norms their attitudes towards should make a difference to the adoption of those attitudes. The attitudes must be subjunctively sensitive to the normative statuses they acknowledge and attribute. And this is to say that the norms are efficacious in that if the content of the norm being acknowledged or attributed were or had been different, then the attitude would be or would have been different. The heroism of the hero is allegorical for the norm governedness of his attitudes in this dual sense. The correctness of his attitudes is to be assessed according to the standard provided by the norms he acknowledges, and his practical attitudes are sensitive to the contents of those norms, in the sense that if the norms were different, the hero's attitudes would be different. The challenge allegorically represented by the Kammerdiener is to make the possibility of the status dependence of normative attitudes so much as intelligible in the face of the standing possibility, which Hegel admits, of purely naturalistic genealogical alternative accounts of the advent of normative attitudes which appeal only to other attitudes. If invocation of normative governance of attitudes by normative statuses is not necessary to account for those attitudes, how can it be legitimate? Insofar as the reductive naturalist challenge to the normativity of agency cannot be met convincingly, the result is alienation from those norms, the loss of traditional zitlich practical appreciation of the status dependence of normative attitudes, of the authority or bindingness of norms on attitudes. The second allegory of the confessing miscreant and the hard-hearted judge presents a different sort of challenge to the intelligibility of the governance of practical attitudes by norms. It stems from Kantian rigorism about what's required for genuine responsiveness to norms rather than from reductive naturalism. What the miscreant confesses is the admixture of non-normative attitudes in the causes of his action. He didn't just act out of an acknowledgement of pure duty for duty's sake. Other attitudes also provided motives to which the action was subjunctively sensitive, in the sense that if they had been different and the norm not, what was done would have been different. That's what the genealogical story tell, tells us about. Subjunctive sensitivity was not limited to the content of the norm being acknowledged. The doing was in this regard both more and less than a pure acknowledgement of the norm. Here the challenge is not that treating the performance as the acknowledgement of a norm is not necessary to explain the practical attitude, but rather that it's not sufficient. If invocation of normative governance is not by itself sufficient to account for the attitudes because of an admixture of contingent particular motives and circumstances, what the penitent confesses, then how can it be legitimate? The challenge to the intelligibility of normative governance comes from the idea that the authority of norms over attitudes must be total in order to be genuine. It's a manifestation of the deformed conception of pure independence. The idea that authority, Hegel's normative independence, is undercut by any sort of correlative responsibility to, dependence on, anything else. This is the practical normative conception that Hegel criticizes allegorically under the rubric of mastery and slavery. Hegel sees Kant as perfectly distilling the essence of the modern form of this conception as part of his otherwise progressive understanding of normativity in terms of autonomy. As a result, Kant adopts a contraction strategy in which genuine doings shrink down to mere willings, since every more robust sense of action involves responsibility to other factors, subjective and objective, which are not themselves in the same sense governed by the norm that rationalizes the willing. In the allegory, the hard-hearted judge is the Kantian rigorist, who takes it that the penitent's confession of an admixture of non-normative motives shows that the action does not also express the acknowledgement of a norm, and so must be judged lawless. The affinity to reductive naturalism of the Kammerdiener should be clear, for there too, the mere possibility of a non-normative reductive naturalistic explanation of attitudes is taken to preempt the normative governance explanation and in that sense to deny the authority of the norm. 
If the normative governance account of an attitude has a rival, it's taken to have no authority at all. Independence is seen as incompatible with any sort of dependence. Any correlative responsibility undermines claims of authority. Unlike the Kammerdiener allegory, the allegory of the hard-hearted judge is extended to provide a path forward to a proper understanding of the status dependence of normative attitudes. Hegel presents the structural transition from modern to postmodern conceptions of agency in the form of a parable, a narrative recounting sequential stages in the relationship between an evil consciousness and a hard-hearted judge, judgment, confession, a refusal of reciprocal confession, the breaking of the hard heart, and the confession of the judge, forgiveness, and the achievement of a new kind of community. Quote, the reconciling yea in which the two eyes let go their antithetical existence is the existence of the eye which is expanded into a duality. This is the final, vernunftig, postmodern conception of reciprocal recognition and so of normativity in Geist, structured by normativity instituted by that newly self-conscious form of recognition. What the contrite agent confesses is everything in the deed that's not norm-governed. In Hegel's idiom, every manifestation of particularity, the agent's circumstances and collateral attitudes in the form of intentions or beliefs, and of contingent unintended consequences. Rather than universality, in Hegel's term, Hegel's term for the norm, the governing normative status. It confesses every failure of the status dependence of practical attitudes, whose content is revealed in the deed as actually done. Confession in this sense is at once a performance partly constitutive of a special form of self-consciousness and a petition for recognition. The connection is forged by Hegel's understanding of self-consciousness as a normative status that's the social product of attitudes of mutual recognition. In Hegel's allegory, the confession is not met with an edelmutig reciprocating recognition, but with a niedertrechtig, merely critical assessment of failure to fulfill responsibilities, failure of attitudes to be normatively governed by statuses. The blaming, hard-hearted Kantian rigorous judge plays, Hegel says, the role of the moral valet to the penitent agent. Quote, the consciousness that judges in this way is itself base, because it divides up the action, producing and holding fast to the disparity of the action with itself. Further, it's hypocrisy, because it passes off such a judging, not as another manner of being wicked, but as the correct consciousness of the action, setting itself up in this unreality and conceit of knowing well and better above the deeds it discredits, and wanting its words without deeds to be taken for a superior kind of reality. End of the quote. The judge's attitudes are exclusively adopted from the perspective of normative assessment. The judge's assessor does not identify with the perspective of the deliberating agent, or even acknowledge the essential complementary roles in constituting normative statuses played by attitudes of assessment and deliberation. That is, the crucial social perspectival distinction of attitudes of attribution to another and acknowledgement oneself of practical commitments. The point of this episode in the allegory is to enforce the contrast with the next step. The breaking of the hard heart describes the adoption by the assessing consciousness of the appropriate edelmutig rec recognitive response to the petition for recognition that is the penitent's confession. That response Hegel denominates forgiveness. To understand the structure of normativity that gives Geist its characteristic postmodern shape, we have to understand the constellation of reciprocal rec recognitive attitudes that institutes that structure. This is recognition in the form of mutual confession and forgiveness, the structure of trust. As I read the allegory, the shift to forgiveness that is the breaking of the judge's hard heart is a move from the judge merely attributing responsibility for the agent's deed to the judge practically acknowledging his own responsibility for that deed. As such, it's an act of identification with the doer by making oneself co-responsible for what was done. The appropriate response to confession of an incapacity to produce deeds that are simply and purely governed by norms is for the judge to make a corresponding confession, to acknowledge, I am as you are, admitting that the judge, like the agent, is also doomed to act 
from a mixture of attitudes that are acknowledgments of governing norms and attitudes that are not such acknowledgments. Its slogan is, we're all bozos on this bus. The responsibility the assessing consciousness undertakes for what's done is socially complementary to the responsibility the deliberating consciousness undertakes for its act, rather than identical with it. It has two dimensions, reparative and recollective. The reparative responsibility is practically to intervene in the still unfolding consequences of the doing, which provide an ever-increasing stock of consequential specifications of it. The deed is never done, and part of the generous edelmutig way of holding someone responsible for what they do is to acknowledge responsibility for helping to make it turn out well. One can do that by practically contributing new consequences, thereby making true new consequential specifications of the deed. When everyone acknowledges a responsibility to do that, each doing by a member of the community whose constitutive recognitive attitudes to one another take the form of confession and forgiveness is a doing by all. The deed of each is the deed of all. Here we can think of Dumas Musketeer's slogan, all for one and one for all. But what count as better consequences? The standard for such normative assessments of consequences is set by the other dimension, the recollective dimension of forgiveness. The reparative responsibility to ameliorate the consequences of the doing being forgiven must be understood in terms of recollection. The aim is to make the whole that results from one's current action, thought of as a contribution to a tradition, more fully and successfully recollectable than that tradition would otherwise be. So this constraint too is defined in terms of recollection. It's the norms of recollection that determine what counts as better consequences and to which contributing to such consequences must be subjectively, subjunctively sensitive. Recognition in the form of recollective forgiveness is the key to understanding norm governance in general for Hegel. Taking recollective responsibility for another's doing is practically acknowledging the obligation to tell and endorse a certain kind of retrospective story about that doing. This is the responsibility to rationally reconstruct it as norm governed. The forgiving recollector must discern an implicit norm that governs the development of the deed. This is an intention in the sense of an object, which stands to the consequentially extended deed or tat as the agent's initial purposing or vorsatz stands to the handlung, the action in the narrow sense, specified only under the descriptions explicitly licensing, licensed by the purposing that initiated the performance. The intention as object must be exhibited as norm normatively governing the doing in the dual sense both of serving as a normative standard for assessment of the practical attitudes it governs, each specification of the doing being thought of as an acknowledgement of that norm, and as being the norm that those attitudes can be seen to have been subjectively sensitive to, in the sense that had the norm been different, so would the attitudes. <clears throat> when recollectively discerns or imputes a norm that's in the form of an intention or object, something that governs the practical process, by specifying what's being striven for or aimed at. Saying that goes beyond just saying that it serves as a normative standard for assessments of the success of practical attitudes. For that could be true without entailing that anyone cares about the standard and is making decisions in the light of what the norm enjoins. The additional element involves thinking of each component of the subsequent retrospectively constructed or discovered tradition as surrounded by a cloud of incompatible alternatives. The recollective forgiver then practically takes or treats the subject of the attitude in question as choosing the alternative taken, the one incorporated in the recollective recognitive forgiveness narrative, as having selected it out of the cloud of relevant alternatives which are sacrificed for it. That's what it is to treat the governing norm as not just a norm of assessment, but as an intention. This is rationally reconstructing a tradition of attitudes that are status dependent in the sense of being governed, in the dual sense, by an implicit norm that becomes gradually more explicit as it's acknowledged by the attitudes incorporated in the recollected tradition. The meta-norm that governs recollective performances and the practical attitudes they express is that the norm one reconstructively discerns or imputes 
must normatively govern all the consequential specifications of attitudes downstream from the action in the narrow sense. That includes the practical reparative and hermeneutic recollective attitudes the assessing judge adopts. So the forgiving agent must endorse the norm being attributed as governing the deed, must acknowledge its authority. That's part of taking co-responsibility for it. In forgiving, one makes oneself responsible for the emerging norm one attributes as the implicit intention of the deed. This is identifying with the agent in the sense of risking and, if need be, sacrificing one's own attitudes by subjecting them to normative assessment according to the norm that one both attributes and acknowledges, and being subjectively sensitive to that norm in one's own attitudes. In this specific sense, the forgiving agent acknowledges the doing as its own, as the doing not only of the agent who initiated it, but also of the forgiving recollector. Forgiving recollection can be understood on the model of institutional common or case law jurisprudential practices. The current judge rationally reconstructs the tradition by selecting a trajectory of prior precedential decisions that are expressively progressive, in that they reveal the gradual emergence into explicitness of a norm, the content of a law, that can be seen to have implicitly governed, in the dual sense, all the decisions or attitudes in the reconstructed tradition. It's that norm that then justifies the current judge's decision. The norm that's seen as emerging from the rationally reconstructed tradition of decisions sets the standard for normative assessment by future judges of the current decision, which claims to be subjunctively sensitive to that very norm. So the recollecting judge subjects herself to, acknowledges the authority of the norm she retrospectively discerns. The more of the prior decisions the recollection rationalizes and exhibits as expressive of the norm, the better the recollective warrant that norm provides for the current decision. Whatever residue there is of decisions that cannot be fit into the retrospective, rationally reconstructed tradition as precedentially rationalizing and expressive of the norm increases the scope for criticism of the current decision by future judges who may or may not acknowledge it as correct and itself precedential. For the only authority the decision has derives from its responsibility to a tradition of prior decisions. Forgiving, recollectively recognizing on this account, is hard work. It can't be brought off with a single sweeping, abstractly general gesture, I forgive you for what you did. One could always say that, but saying it wouldn't make it so. Besides commitment to practically affect the consequences of the doing one is forgiving, one must produce a concrete recollective reconstruction of the deed under all its intentional and consequential specifications. Recollection is a kind of making, the crafting of a distinctive kind of narrative that's successful only insofar as it ends up being recognizable as having the form of a finding. That seems a perverse description of a doing, but it's giving contingency the normative form of necessity. Recollection is the narrative genre in which the rationalization of decisions appealing to commoner case law belongs. One must recruit and assemble the raw materials one inherits so as to exhibit a norm one can endorse oneself as always having governed the tradition to which one, oneself belongs and with which one, oneself identifies. A tradition that shows up as progressively revealing a governing norm, making ever more explicit what was all along implicit. The expressively progressive tradition discerned culminates for now in the consequential specification of the doing that is the recollection itself. Well, we could ask, what if what one's given to work with is too hard to forgive in this demanding sense? What if the subject of the attitude that's being forgiven as part of the larger enterprise of forgiving something upstream of it is in fact dispositionally unresponsive to the verdict of the norm? What if, as the Kammerdiener alleges, it is in fact sensitive only to other attitudes and concerns particular to its subject? It seems that the criteria of adequacy for successful forgiveness, both reparative and recollective, are in many cases impossible to satisfy. Some things people have done, we want to say, are simply unforgivable. The 20th century offers plentiful candidates. In some cases, though, we might try to mitigate the consequences of evil doings 
We just have no idea how to go about discerning the emergence of a governing norm we could endorse ourselves. And this situation doesn't just arise in extraordinary cases. Any actual recollective story will involve strains, elements of what's actually done at every stage in the developing process that cannot be smoothly, successfully, or convincingly given such norm-responsive explanation. Indeed. But now we must ask, whose fault is it that the doing is unforgivable? The doer or the forgiver? Is the failure that of the bad agent or of the bad recollector? Is it a matter of how things anyway just are, given what was done, considered as a settled fact? Or is it because the recollector couldn't come up with a more norm-responsive narrative? The first is the attitude of the unsittlich Kammerdiener, for whom no one is practically norm, un, practically norm acknowledging hero, in the sense of being genuinely responsive and sensitive to norms. To treat the recollective failure as wholly the fault of the doer, to take it as simply an objective fact that there's no norm we could endorse that governs the deed as the assessor inherits it, is to adopt exactly the blaming practical attitude of the hard-hearted judge, an attitude Hegel criticizes as niederträchtig. The contrasting edelmütig attitude he recollectively, re he recollectively recommends as implicit in the idea of norm governedness as such is rather to identify with the doer, to take co-responsibility for the doing. That is to acknowledge at least equal responsibility on the part of the un unsuccessful forgiver. For the issue is not po properly posed in alethic modal terms of the possibility or impossibility of forgiving what was done. It's rather a deontic normative matter. One is committed to forgiving, responsible for forgiving. We have here a Hegelian version of a Kantian regulative ideal. The governing regulative ideal is tout comprendre, c'est tout pardonner. One can be committed to that ideal, normatively governed by it in the dual sense, even if one must confess that in many cases one cannot understand and so forgive all. It might well be that one is in fact incapable of fulfilling that commitment, of carrying out that responsibility. If and insofar as that's so, it's a normative failure that the unsuccessful would-be forgiver should confess. To take proper rec recognitive recollective responsibility requires the forgiving agent to confess her own inadequacy to the recollective task. Your confession of a failure of your practical attitudes appropriately to acknowledge a norm is a petition for my recognition in the form of my forgiving taking co-responsibility for your doing. My subsequent failure to adopt adequately forgiving recollective recognitive attitudes is something I'm in turn responsible for confessing. That confession is itself an act of identification with you. I am as you are. My attitudes, like yours, fail adequately to satisfy the norms they nonetheless acknowledge as binding, as governing those attitudes. For one acknowledges an obligation, the bindingness of a governing norm, insofar as one confesses the extent to which one has been unresponsive to the demands of the recollective norm, unable properly to fulfill a responsibility one acknowledges. And one is genuinely sensitive to that normative demand in making such a confession. So confessing is what one must do to make it the case that, that one is in fact sensitive to the norm recollected as governing the attitudes that make up the tradition one has discerned, including one's own attitudes, even though one is incapable of fulfilling the responsibility one thereby acknowledges. As an edelmutig, magnanimous, forgiving assessor of another's doing, one confesses that it's also one's own fault that one is not good enough at forgiving. And one must trust that this failure too, like the failure of the original inadequately forgiven doer, will be more successfully forgiven by future assessors who know more and are better at it. That one cannot successfully tell a recollective story is not what matters. That's a deontic failure relative to one's commitments. It's something to be confessed in trust that that failure too can be forgiven. The well-meaning but incompetent forgiving recollector's confession like that of the contrite agent, is a petition for recognition in the form of forgiveness. The trusting confession of recollective failure completes the identification of the one playing the role of the assessor with the one playing the role of the deliberating agent. The recognitive attitudes of forgiveness and confession emerge as two sides of one coin, 
two aspects of the symmetric recognitive structure, the norm instituting structure of trust. Its slogan is, attribute responsibility forgivingly, acknowledge responsibility contritely. In a normative community with this recognitive structure, everyone forgives to the limits of their ability and everyone confesses those limits and trusts that they too will be forgiven from them, from each according to his abilities, to each according to his needs. The content of the shared recognitive attitudes with which all identify is, forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass before us. It's of the essence of both the reparative, reparative ameliorating dimension and the hermeneutic recollective dimension of the recognitive attitude of forgiveness that they address a performance that, addresses, that expresses a prior practical attitude. The doing being forgiven must already be underway. And for this reason, the final vernünftig form of reciprocal recognition as confession and forgiveness is essentially historical. The attitude governing norms it institutes and acknowledges have the rich diachronic recognitive structure of traditions. Hegel practices forgiving recollection, retrospectively rationally reconstructing expressively progressive traditions in his own accounts of intellectual and cultural history and in the way he reads the histories of art, religion, and especially philosophy. It's what I mean to be practicing in telling this story. The claim that's crucial for understanding the third age of Geist as retaining the progress made by modernity while overcoming its structural alienation is that recognition understood as including the recollective institution of traditions acknowledges both the attitude, in, the attitude dependence of normative statuses and the status dependence of normative attitudes. On the one hand, it incorporates the insight that norms, normative statuses, are instituted by reciprocal recognition. That is, by recognitive attitudes that are symmetric in the sense of being suitably complemented. On the other hand, each recollectively rational reconstruction is obliged to display the normative attitudes it addresses as governed by norms, by normative statuses, in the dual sense of being subject to assessment according to those norms and being subjectively sensitive to them. In this way, the postmodern recognitive practice reachieve a zitlik appreciation of the authority of norms over attitudes, the sense in which attitudes are responsible to, governed by norms that they acknowledge and attribute as genuinely binding. It's true that acknowledgement of the authority of governing norms is always within the scope of a recollective, rational, reconstructive story about what's going on. The normative status on which attitudes are understood as dependent, to which they're responsible, is itself always the object of a recollective attitude. In this sense, the overall account invokes nothing but attitudes. But that statuses are status dependent, that is norm governed, is an essential, necessary, and characteristic structural feature of every recollective attitude as such. And in that sense, the status dependence of normative attitudes is not merely a contingent product of some attitudes people happen to adopt. It is, in the end, what makes normative attitudes normative attitudes, acknowledgments and attributions distinguished by their social perspectives, of normative statuses of responsibility and authority. Agency in the age of trust reachieves the heroic character, so striking in the original ancient form of agency, that was pushed out by the ironic distancing and alienation from norms essential to the achievement of individual self-consciousness that is the triumph of modern over traditional forms of normative life. Central to heroism was what Hegel called character, the decisive zitlik identification of an individual agent with the norms, practically treating them as authoritative over and binding on one's attitudes. This is an acknowledgement of the status dependence of normative attitudes, of one's attitudes as norm governed. The ought to do's governing normative attitudes, acknowledged or attributed responsibilities, are understood as wholly determined by the ought to be's that articulate normative statuses what someone's really responsible for or committed to, their duty. As a result, the heroic agent takes responsibility for every aspect of his act. If some feature of it is not as it ought to be, that is confessed to be the agent's responsibility, whether or not it was intended or foreseen. Compared to the contracted modern conception, the heroic conception makes the agent primarily responsible for a much expanded deed, stretching out to include distant, unanticipated consequences. 
This was the reason that traditional heroism was essentially tragic. It requires subjecting oneself to dark, the dark, unknowable power of fate, identifying with what one has made by forces beyond one's knowledge and control. Shouldering the responsibility that fate in this sense brings down on one who acts is tragic heroism. And heroism in the age of trust is like heroism in the age of tragedy, in its zitlich acknowledgement of the bindingness of norms, in the sense of their governing authority over normative attitudes, the status dependence of those attitudes. There are norms that set standards for assessment of the correctness of our attitudes of acknowledging and attributing responsibility and authority. And it is the responsibility of each agent to be sensitive to those norms, shaping her attitudes accordingly. Each forgiving, retrospective, recollective, rational reconstruction of an expressively progressive tradition of attitudes is responsible for discerning just such governing norms. And where the cramped and contracted modern practical conception of agency drew a bright line between normatively attributable and assessable aspects of each doing and non-normative ones, between what the agent can properly be held responsible for, because done knowingly or intentionally, and what's done only in the sense of happening because of such doings in a narrow sense, the trusting conception is heroic, like the tragic conception, in that responsibility is total. Responsibility is taken for the whole deed. There's no aspect of intentional doings that overflows and falls outside the normative realm of responsibility. No specification of the deed for which no one takes responsibility. In Geist, with the recognitive structure of trust, responsibility for the deed is shared between the agent whose practical attitudes initiated the doing and the members of her recognitive community who take it as their own by committing themselves to forgiving it. Agency is understood and practiced within the magnanimous recognitive structure of confession and forgiveness combines these two heroic aspects of the pre-modern conception. One, the zitlik appreciation of the status dependence of normative attitudes and acknowledging total responsibility for the deed as consequentially extending beyond the knowledge and control of the agent. It can maintain a heroic expanded conception of the deed for which responsibility is taken because it has an expanded conception of who's responsible for each doing. Complementary recognitive attitudes both institute the governing norms and acknowledge the authority of the norms so instituted. The essentially historical fine structure of these reciprocally related recognitive attitudes and normative statuses articulates a social division of normative labor between the agent whose practical attitudes initiate a self-conscious intentional doing, who takes responsibility for it in one sense, and members of the agent's recognitive community who take responsibility for it in another sense. In this way, the two essentially modern insights into the attitude dependence of normative statuses and the distinction of responsibility marked by the individual agent's rights of intention and knowledge are respected and synthesized with the two principal features of pre-modern heroic agency. But the vernunftig, trusting conception of agency as heroic does away with the element of tragic subjection to fate. Fate showed up as an alien, inhuman force in the tragic form of agency because it was a non-normative force, one that, although not itself governed by norms, nevertheless substantially shapes our normative responsibilities. What was left to us was bearing up and carrying on in the face of the results of incursions by alien fate into the properly normative realm in which we dwell. The neo-heroic form of practical normativity replaces fate, something that happens, with something that we do. What happens is given the form of something done. Immediacy, contingency, particularity, and their recalcitrance to conceptualization are not done away with, but they now take their proper place. For we appreciate the necessary role they play in the process of determining the contents of the norms we both institute by our recognitive attitudes and acknowledge as governing that experiential process. The burdens of tragic subjection to fate are replaced by the tasks of concrete magnanimous forgiveness. Where our normative conceptual digestion and domestication of immediacy, contingency, and particularity shows its limitations, when, as in each case, as the Camardina reminds us at some point they must, they outrun our recollective capacity to incorporate them into the mediated normative conceptual form of governing universals, that failure of ours is properly acknowledged by confession and trust in the forgiveness of that failure 
to fulfill our responsibilities by no more knowledgeable and cap capable future recollectors. One of the last passages in the phenomenology, the wounds of the spirit heal and leave no scars behind. The deed is not imperishable. It's taken back by spirit into itself. And the aspect of individuality present in it, whether as an intention or an existent negativity and limitation, straightway vanishes. The self that carries out the action, the form of its act, is only a moment of the whole. And so, likely, and so likewise is the knowledge that by its judgment determines and establishes the distinction between the individual and the universal aspects of action. End of the quote. The responsibility that the individual tragic heroic agent takes on himself is accordingly in the modern form spread out and shared. The doing of each in one sense is now in a real sense the doing of all in another recognitively complementary sense. For all share responsibility for and authority over each action. The distinctive essential role played by individual agents is not obliterated for the responsibility and authority acknowledged by and attributed to the initiating agent is different from the reparative and recollective responsibility and authority acknowledged by those who take up the burden of forgiving the agent. Every deed now shows up both as a practical contribution to the content of all that came before it and as acknowledging a recollective responsibility with respect to all those deeds. The temporally extended, historically structured recognitive community of those who are alike in all confessing the extent of their failures to be norm-governed, acknowledging their responsibility to forgive those failure in, failures in others, confessing the ways in which their efforts at recollective and reparative forgiveness fell short of their goal, and trusting that a way will be found to forgive their failures is one in which each member identifies with all the others, taking responsibility for their practical attitudes. It is what Hegel calls the I that is we and the we that is I. Yeah, uh, I mean, you're describing difficulties of confession and, and maybe confessing a failure to identify with the ones who, with the Romans who, you know, created a, a particular massacre. That, uh, that is, that they aren't members of your recognitive community insofar as you say, look, this was just so, so long ago and far off that it's, it has nothing to do with me. Uh, I didn't attribute to Hegel the claim that uh, we're better at it and no more. That was all in the scope of we trust that those who come after us you know, will be able to do what we couldn't do maybe because they uh, are better at it and no more. Uh, that's you know, a, a normative stance that we take. You're giving reasons to think yeah, well, it may get more and more and more difficult rather than less and less difficult as times go on. I think you know that that very well might be matter of factually true. Uh, it, it isn't going to change the nature of the obligation that uh, Hegel sees us as acknowledging. 
Yes. Yeah, thank you for this uh, really rich, rich talk. One of the things that struck me about your reconstruction of phenomenology is the highly Christianized language in which you put people's accounts, contrition, confession, forgiveness, sin. These are you know, clearly theological Very much Hegel's sort of coded language for speaking about you know Jewish ethics too. He, he, in the spirit of Christianity and its faith, he explicitly relates you know Kantian legalism to Jewish legalism in a way, in a way in which those are both transcended in, in a new philosophy or sort of Christianized philosophy. And even up to the point of your citing the, the Lord's Prayer as a sort of fulfillment of this Hegelian you know, quest. It's, very, it's a very Christian narr Christianized narrative, although you never actually use that word to describe it. So my question is, can you be, can we accept your account, this reconstructed account of Hegel's phenomenology, without at the same time confessing <laughs> and admitting to the, the, the Christian theological uh, framework in which, in which it is put. Can you be a Hegelian in any other way than the Christian form that you present? Yeah. I, I mean, I, I think yes and no. Uh, he means to be doing here, I think, what uh, Kant does in Religion Within the Bounds of Reason Alone, that is reading uh, Christian theology as an allegory for uh, fundamental facts about the structure of normativity, in particular fundamental uh, facts about the structure of modern normativity rather than the uh, ancient traditional one that he's uh, uh, talking about. Uh, so he's explicitly using the, the Christian language, the language of the time that he's trying to capture uh, in thought. Uh, in the philosophy of right, uh, his picture of modernity there, he's not sort of looking to the next stage, but he clearly thinks uh, if you've got a nation state, if you've got representative political institutions, if you have a market economy, bourgeois family, and Protestant Christianity, you've really got modernity. You, you, you are, um, it, maybe there's some rough edges that need to be worn off, but, the, but that really is the essence that uh, modernity is aiming for. As I say, there he doesn't seem to be sort of pointing beyond it. Uh, and, and I think it's with that picture that, uh, in mind that he's trying to read the allegory of what the Protestant Christianity, that language, uh, what deeper truths that was really telling us. Uh, I mean, if you take it just as Christian theology, he's a very heterodox uh, Christian, but by the time you've uh, allowed him to read these uh, allegories. But he does mean to be telling us, you know, there is something true about what they said. He is recollectively forgiving that language, uh, which uh, from his point of view, uh, read non-allegorically, incorporates a literally unbelievable metaphysics of morals, uh, indeed a pre-modern uh, pre one, but which went through a transformation and uh, came to be a language available uh, uh, for moderns. He's telling us how that language can uh, be available for postmoderns. Uh, I interpreted his reading of the allegory sort of allegorically and used his language, but I think you can say all of these things without uh, 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 picking confession and forgiveness. Uh, indeed, um, I mean, those, I use those terms because those are the terms he uses. Uh, but the language of uh, Niederträchtigkeit and Edelmütigkeit, for instance, that has a lot more to do with sort of ancient Greek pictures of magnanimity and pusillanimity than it does with any particular uh, Christian picture. Uh, so I, I think the scheme ends up swinging free of uh, the allegory of Christian theology that he uses to convey it. Uh, but insofar as it doesn't, insofar as his 
uh, forgiveness of his recollective forgiveness uh, of that language didn't take him far enough away from it, well, then that's a, a task for us to, to tell the story in a, uh, a way that swings freer of that language. Uh, it would be a recollected, forgiven version of his story. Uh, the, make, the making that is successful only insofar as it has the shape of a finding. Um, Yeah, Shelley. So I have to confess that there were large stretches of your talk that I simply couldn't follow. Um, it was at such a high level of abstraction, but I just want to ask about like, one bit of it uh, that seemed to figure, you know, especially moving to the, the postmodern stretch with uh, the norm of forgiveness. And I'm not sure I grasp what that's supposed to be, but I, I take it that you weren't merely trying to say, here's what Hegel's up to, but you were trying to say, and here, this is an attractive picture of, what, of, of how we should construe what we're doing in the generation of norms and how we should think of them as governing our, both generated by our attitudes and yet governing our attitudes and so on. So, so, so then if the thought's supposed to be that it's attractive to think that we should strive to forgive everything, that seems objectionable to me for two reasons. I want to know about why it's attractive. So one is one that you mentioned, but I didn't catch the following through on, namely, there are just some things that are not forgivable, where I don't take that to be shorthand for, I'm not up to the task. I take that to mean, there are some things that we shouldn't forgive, and to take ourselves to be under an obligation to forgive them is to fail to grasp the horrendousness of the deeds. So I don't see why I would want to accept the norm. And there's a second thing, which is it seems to, this is a, a strange way to put it, but it seems to, to operate under that norm, uh, to, to be striving to forgive everything is to infantilize um, people and to not actually recognize them as capable of genuinely unforgivable deeds. I, I feel like some scene in a sitcom where somebody does something horrendous and then character number two keeps Represented. So what you mean to say is this in some positive light, and the character says, no, 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 is a plus. What you mean to say in some other positive light, and it's failing to hear that this is a person here who doesn't want to be seen necessarily under a positive light. And so that seems to me a second, it's, it's failing to take the person seriously to insist on hearing them as acting in conformity with some norm that we've all along accepted, but maybe we hadn't quite fully realized it would come here. So, so these two things, I don't find the norm attractive. What am I missing? Well, there's, this is a Pollyanna picture that, that he has. The, yeah, but I, I took you to be not just saying, oh, look at this interesting, unacceptable view that this dead man has. Um, uh, no, I, 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 do, I do think it's, it's an attractive view uh, that uh, there isn't and could not be an objective fact of an act so that was intrinsically evil, uh, objectively so, so that uh, it, it was not... Uh, a matter of our, uh, a matter available to, uh, responsible to our attitudes towards it. That that seems to me a, a remnant of a pre-modern way uh, of thinking. So the phrase available to our attitudes, do you mean evaluatable under them, or do you mean forgivable? That is to say, viewable as something that, you know, all right, this is, this is in conformity with something well, that we accept. Penetratable by them, changeable by uh, our attitudes. Um, I mean, Hegel is in, I see it's a Pollyannish view, he's in. Uh, the Leibnizian tradition, everything's for the best in this best of all possible worlds. Uh, in Kant, this becomes a regulative uh, ideal. Well, that's the that's way we should uh, think about it. In Hegel, it becomes the object of 
a commitment, uh, uh, an obligation to uh, acknowledge a responsibility to make that so. Uh, and uh, this carefully crafted, crafted notion of uh, recollective rationality, what he thinks of as um, reasons march through history, uh, you know, the world we get is not rational as it comes to us, but if you look on the world with rational eyes, the world will look rationally back. How do you do that? You do that by telling these uh, recollective, uh, rationalizing stories. And he doesn't see a limit in principle to that uh, and, and wouldn't allow the idea that it could just be an objective fact that there were things that were impenetrable, uh, impenetrable to that. Uh, maybe there's a feature of the world that he's overlooking there, but uh, I, I do find the the commitment that he's summoning us to uh, an attractive one. I mean, you also uh, asked whether this wasn't a, a view that infantilized those who are forgiven. Uh, Hegel notoriously has uh, a hard to motivate view of punishment as uh, something the community positively owes to the miscreant. Uh, the, the miscreant has uh, uh, attempted to um, flee the recognitive community, is trying not to adopt practical attitudes of recognizing other people's authority or responsibility, and the community says, no, we, we still recognize you. We, uh, you you're, you're still one of us, uh, and, and argues that the punishment is uh, the form that recognition needs to take. It says, no, no, you can't uh, reject moral community with us. Now, maybe that's uh, an unintuitive or infantilizing sort of view. Well, why shouldn't he if he wants to reject recognition uh, with us? Yeah, in the end, well, it's because he can talk. You know, if you can talk, you really are one of us. We do have this. Uh, obligation to you. Again, that's a, that sort of universalizing is a, is a kind of... Um, would, would such punishment be forgiveness on your scheme? It, it depends on what you mean by punishment. Uh, locking. I, 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 I don't mean by forgiveness. Uh, you know, is the guy in jail? Uh, no, lo locking someone in a cage can't be uh, recognizing them as one of us. That's oh treating someone as an animal rather than as uh, one of us. The, uh, I mean, what you get is your reparative responsibility. Well, that's uh, uh, all right. We've, we've got to mitigate the effects of what you did. But the recollective one, too, is to incorporate it into uh, a progressive understanding of what we're all doing. Um, and. Uh, what the connection is between that and uh, traditional notions of punishment, and that's not something I have a story uh, about. This is sort of the background that, together with some other premises, leads Hegel to that uh, way of thinking about, uh, about punishment. Uh, I mean, I think this leads to a reparative, restorative, well, a recollective uh, theory of maybe not punishment, but of forgiveness. Creon now transferring legal 
uh, power makes Creon's exile him from the city. Um, so I'm guessing, it, to me, it seems like uh, it's not so much like a recognition that Oedipus has that the people around him can't forgive him, um, but rather that he himself is owning up to the, the, the unintended consequences. That it's not, it's not because he's a, 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 a well, rather let me phrase it this way, it's that uh, he, even though he acknowledges that it's not his intention to have married, or to, to have married his mother and his father, that since it is such a case, he has to be responsible for it. Not in the sense that it's his fault, but that he can't leave it undone. That he has to afford an action. At least that's how I understood it. So, uh, I'm wondering if you're well, I, mean, I, th I, I think yeah. indeed he, you know, himself completely buys into the uh, pre-modern conception and. He has done these things. He is a parasite, uh, and so he's responsible for that. Uh, that's not something he can get out from under. Whatever kinds of atonement uh, he can think of are not going to undo that, but they might acknowledge that he is this bad person because he uh, killed his father. Uh, the claim in modernity is uh, if you find yourself you know, with the best will in the world trying to do something good, doing something that has uh, a bad consequence, you want to say, look, you aren't really responsible. If, if you could not have foreseen this as uh, a consequence of what you did, it was not what you intended, you couldn't have foreseen it, then you can be sorry that this the, about the bad sequelae from it, but you would be wrong to, to blame yourself for that. Uh, you're not uh, responsible for it in any except uh, the most attenuous the most tenuous of uh, senses, try and teach you not to take responsibility for it. I mean, we see uh, more sophisticated versions of this. Uh, you know, Hegel sees in not the Oedipus, but in the Antigone uh, Sophocles play, the first sort of bubbling up of modernity. Uh, and there's various other bubblings up of, of it. And this, in this particular one, Aquinas's doctrine of double effect uh, is making a distinction that Hegel himself, as far as I can see, doesn't make between what he calls the right of intention and the right of knowledge, saying, look, if uh, we consider two cases where you do the bad thing uh, in both of them, but in one of them, that's why you did it. You wanted to do the bad thing. That was content of your intention. And in the other, the content of your intention was not doing the bad thing, but you knew that if you did what you were going to do, that the bad thing would be a result. Uh, and Aquinas says, well, in the second case, you're not as culpable as you are in the first case, where the bad thing was uh, part of the intention, part of the reason for which uh, you did it. it sort of the basis of a vast casuistic uh, literature. But, it, but it's absolutely an expression of this um, sense of modernity that uh, Hegel is articulating uh, for us to, to make distinctions of culpability uh, based on knowledge and intention. Uh, and you know, we would see um, pre-modern remnants, uh, you know, if you're the mafia bodyguard and your principal gets killed, then you get killed. It doesn't matter whether there was anything you could have done about it. Your responsibility was to protect him, and if you didn't do that, uh, then off with your head. Uh, well, that's a remnant of this uh, sort of pre-modern, uh, pre-modern sense. The bloodthirsty um, uh, sense of whether whether what you did was was the party line, and you say in the time of Stalin. Well, at the time I did it, this was the party line. Look at the newspaper there. Yes, but it isn't the party line now. And it doesn't matter that you were doing what you thought was the party line because that was what everyone was saying. Well, if it's not in accord with the party line now, then you're responsible uh, for it. That, that's a remnant of a pre-modern uh, notion of responsibility. So Oedipus himself didn't have this thought available to him. So he took responsibility heroically for all these descriptions. You might have to respond to that. All right. Is that, uh, it's not possible to have simultaneously a concept of atonement and forgiveness. In the sense that 
you know, I, I'm not guilty of these actions, but I still can't leave it undone. That maybe I, this doesn't feel like he's responsible in the sense that, again, he didn't intend it, but it, it is still a responsibility in the fact that now that the truth has been revealed, I have to do something about it. Like, well, I, I guess I don't understand. I mean, for, forgiveness is, isn't really in the, in the picture at all. I mean, he can feel bad that uh, this thing happened to him. Uh, that it turned out that he's this bad uh, person, that, that he is the parasite. Uh, and if atonement is uh, appropriate for that, uh, okay, but it's not gonna, it's not gonna undo it uh, at all. It's just his acknowledgement that, yes, it's not that I think being a parasite is a good thing. No, I, I'm terrible. Uh, so I, I'm not seeing any um, uh, remnant, a, a, any bit of, Modern sensibility in that uh, in that story. Uh. Thank you very much for the speech. Uh, I, I think this question is based on a misunderstanding, but even so, knowing what it is would be good for me. So, I have a question about the moment of forgiveness. I understand that we begin with a norm and a certain action that was guided by a bad intention. Maybe I oversimplified, but. From what I understand, the rational reconstruction involves giving a certain redescription to what was deemed bad in the first place. So my question is, under the new description of what the intention of the agent was, do we get a, a, cer a certain opposition between that norm that in some sense we understand as part of our community and the original norm that judged the, in some sense, unreconstructed intention. Because it, it, it seems hard for me to see how we could get the, because in that case, if we recognize both, both norms as ours, it would seem that we no longer recognize the fault in the original intention. So from what, from what I, I assume that in this process of reconstruction, we also reconstruct the original norm or appeal to some higher standard that distinguishes the norms. I mean, it, it, it's a delicate matter to talk about the original norm after we've done this rational reconstruction. Right. Think about it uh, in, in the cases of the judges of common law. So at one point we're looking back and we need to decide whether uh, this is a case of strict liability in the, in, in the civil court. And so we've got these cases, all there is to go on is, well, in this set of facts it was decided that the individual was strictly liable, in this other case it was decided that it wasn't. Now we've got a new set of facts. Uh, the only rationale we can give for making a decision one way or another is to invoke the authority of these previous uh, decisions, and so we do that, we tell a story, well, these are the respects of similarity and dissimilarity, these are the important ones, uh, and these are the cases that were precedential, that, that I'm treating as really having authority to, to uh, determine what the law is that's um, uh, on display here. And we say, well, what about these other cases? Uh, if, if you're right, in the current judge giving this rationale, uh, not only are you not treating that case as uh, precedential, but you're treating it as mistaken by, by the rule that you're extracting from this. That decision was wrongly decided. Well, yes, that's uh, according to me, you know, what I'm seeing, the norm that I see as uh, being expressed in these decisions, uh, some of these earlier decisions, they were just wrong. Uh, but maybe a judge who comes on after me, uh, we get a new, set of, uh, a new set of facts, decisions to make, they say, no, no, I'm the one who misapplied the law. There's something I didn't understand about the norm whose boundaries are getting more and more clear, and actually the one that I took to be uh, wrongly decided, that was correctly decided uh, and is precedential. It was exhibiting a contour of the emerging norm that I, when I made my decision uh, about it, was simply uh, blind to. Uh, that sort of uh, reevaluation, sort of at every stage, uh, 
though the law courts try and minimize that sort of thing, um, happens all the time. And that's a, a model and anyway, an instance of uh, the sort of thing that I'm attributing that I'm attributing to him, that we're to treat those uh, actions and practical attitudes that are not in accord with the norm uh, that governs them in the sense of being the standard for assessment of correctness or incorrectness for them, according to this rational reconstruction of that, uh, to see that as uh, a call to acknowledge a commitment to find a better story that will incorporate uh, these two as uh, in accord with the now reconstructed uh, norm. Acknowledging that we're never going to get everything in, that's what we have to confess, but uh, acknowledging also the, the commitment to uh, do what we can. Do a follow-up, put a follow-up, because I got far more confused now. I have a trouble understanding what the status. So at, at some point, each of us, I guess, has a certain understanding of what parts of the history we accept as being ours now, and what is in some sense wrong. Do I get this right? It, 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 some some decisions I take to be wrong, to be bad, and some, mm -hmm. like, right? So once I take an action to be, in some sense, initially unforgivable, it, I, I, I just don't understand how I could possibly forgive this. If I end up finding the way I am also responsible for it, will I end up seeing some truth and what I thought was decisively wrong. And in that case, if I know that in every case this is going to happen, how could I ever say that something is decisively wrong? Do I always need to keep in mind that I, I'm, not, I'm only half saying that this past decision is wrong? Oh, OK, I mean, I see a, a certain uh, point of contact with Shelley's worry that you're, you're going to be uh, undercutting the distinction between what is in accord with the norm and what is not in accord with the norm if uh, whenever you make the decision and say, okay, that's not in accord with it, this is, you have that little asterisk on it, but uh, in a better story, this would be uh, in accord with it. Uh, yeah, he's giving uh, a radical new semantics, a, a new theory of the content of norms. Indeed, that's my principal interest is in the semantic, uh, the semantic story that says, uh, uh, we're accustomed to thinking about the contents of these norms as though they were sort of crystalline things that were there that, that drew lines uh, like this. Uh, in fact, contents are these, the contents of conceptual norms uh, are these protein growing things that we can, we have to understand in terms of uh, a retrospective perspective. Uh, on them. Every time we look back, we do make uh, a distinction between uh, correct and incorrect uh, applications. And looking forward, where we're looking at the process of, well, uh, looking forward, it looks like we're changing the norms that we inherit by making it, uh, by treating some as precedential and others as not. Uh, the jurisprudential slogan for the uh, case law and common law I'm talking about is judge-made law. They're saying that they're not interpreting law, they're making it up as they go along. And there's a sense in which that's right because there is nothing to it except what's been put into it by these decisions. And yet it's an essential element that everybody is not just arbitrarily uh, deciding this or that, but the only authority their decision has is the extent to which they're responsible to the, to the things before. And so he's challenging us to, to think about the contents of our own thoughts and intentions as own, not sort of having their content all in the moment when you have the belief or have the intention, but being contentful only as part of a uh, extended, uh, a thing that's ex extended in time and which from one point of view uh, isn't changing, it's just becoming more explicit. 
but from another point of view, all the determinateness is being put into it by the attitudes of applying it in one case and refusing to apply it in another case. And I think it is hard to get our minds around thinking of the contents of our own minds in that sort of way. Um, I find the, I personally find the um, self-reconstructive power that Hegel attributes to reason to be attractive indeed. But my, what I have difficulty grasping is how you get from that uh, uh, reconstrual of, of uh, norms to the retrieval of the heroic condition, which you concluded with, because it seems at least on face value that heroism consists in the accomplishment of an exceptional deed and not in being forgiven for a radical failure. But I imagine that that's based on um, uh, misunderstanding of what you said. Well, I was saying uh, heroism in the, in the classic sense uh, is bearing up under the fact that, sort of accepting the fact that um, everything you do gets significance is outside of your control, and nonetheless accepting responsibility for all those things. That that's the the heroic. That that's what's heroic uh, is. Uh, not sort of begging off and saying, oh, but I didn't know. Uh, yes, that can, as I say, engender sympathy, but uh, the hero has to say, but, but that's who I am. And, and to realize that um, uh, what you are is not entirely up to you. It depends on fate. You throw the stone, which might uh, kill someone and now you're a murderer uh, or miss them entirely and uh, no harm, no foul. Uh, but if it does hit someone, you can, well, I didn't uh, mean to, or even in that case, you know, didn't know that that even might happen. Uh, that, that's the original heroism, is taking responsibility for uh, the doing under all of these descriptions. Uh, and the claim was that in the, his picture of the postmodern age of trust, there at least won't be a distinction between aspects of the deed that fall outside the normative realm. No, no one is responsible for them, even though it, it's a feature of the doing. Uh, it's just you need to expand the notion of the agent uh, in that regard beyond the context of deliberation to the context of assessment where the, where the judge uh, sort of lives uh, looking on at it and see the significance of what's done as the product of their recognitive negotiation, this, this uh, process. Well, perhaps that's uh, a <laughs>